Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar with Margot Note. My name is Bradley, and I will be your moderator for this webinar titled Archivists Elevating Through Branding. Before we start, I would like to provide some information about our company and introduce today's presenter. Lucidia is a software developing company specialized in museum and archival collections management solutions, as well as knowledge management and library automation systems. Our brands include Sydney, Presto, Argus, Archivera, Eloquent, and Quadristar. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce today's presenter, Margot Note. Margot Note is an author, archivist, and records manager helping individuals and organizations harness their history. As a principal of Margot Note Consulting LLC, she facilitates the understanding of the importance of unique collections, suggesting ways to manage them and to use them to tell stories to connect with people. She's also a popular guest author for Lucidia's Think Clearly blog and has provided us with many great webinars that are listed on our website. So please feel free to check those out after today's session. Take it away, Margo. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I think in the scope of this webinar series and this book that I wrote about advocating as an archivist, I really wanted to take some time to talk about branding and PR initiatives and spend some time kind of talking about what, what that's all about. So obviously any type of branding or public relations that you do as an archivist or for your archives department, it raises awareness about your services and your expertise. It helps build credibility because you're kind of getting in front of people and telling the story of the archives in your department. And it also engages stakeholders. It lets them know that you're there. I mean, I think part of the whole reason for this internal ad advocacy is to engage your stakeholders to say that you are a resource, you are kind of the wisdom of the organization. Unlike other departments that are focused, let's say, on the present, and maybe they project a little bit into the future if they're doing strategy, as archivists, when we're positioned in um, organizations, we have a really unique role. We're looking at the past, we're looking at the present, and we're looking at the future. Our lens is really wide. We're also touching in every single department. So it is a very unique role that people might not really realize um, the capacity that we have to help them. So part of that is reshaping perceptions. And I think what's interesting about archivists and archives is people don't really know what we do. And I always compare it to like account accountants, like, I've, I'm not an accountant. I'm not really exactly sure what their day-to-day -day looks like, but I can tell you what I think maybe their um, educational path is, their career path, and kind of what they're responsible for, even though I've never done accounting of any nature beyond my own personal or maybe um, company accounting, which is very little. But people don't really know what archivists do or they kind of project what they think archivists do. Um, they don't really understand and, and archives are kind of a black box. And I should say too, archivists are not always the best at educating people about what we do. Um, so there is this kind of reshaping perceptions or even shaping a perception. Um, there is this kind of black box about what we do. So we really want to tell people inside of our organization that we are uh, collaborators. We help craft an identity of what we do as an archivist, and we want to amplify our impact, how we reach the organization and support the mission and the values and the work that our colleagues do. And a big part of that is effective communication, making sure that you're communicating your value and showing how you can help other people. And um, also, I've noticed this too, we like, to, as archivists, we like to be in the weeds, we like to be in the details. And sometimes when we're talking to, let's say, decision makers or people that are, the people that are responsible for the resources, they're looking at kind of more big picture. Um, and sometimes it's hard to get out of, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, it's hard to get out of the mindset of that granularity to talk more about kind of what our what my work or our work is doing to support their bigger goals and whether or not it's right that we have to communicate i mean that's just kind of the reality that we live in people aren't necessarily aren't necessarily going to take the time to understand what we do so we have to advocate and discuss uh what we do to them through branding and pr and for advocating ourselves 
So there are a lot of challenges. There's this mis, uh, misconceptions. I mean, I think we've all read the articles about the dusty archives, old, that archivists are cloistered. Things are always being discovered in the archives where it's really, well, it's been on a finding aid since, you know, 1974. It's been cataloged. It's been on a shelf. Everyone's known about it. The archivists know about it. But suddenly a historian discovers it in the archives. I mean, that's kind of this this narrative that I hear and I feel like um, like that kind of Kill Bill music where Emma um, Emma Berman, or is that her name? Where she hears that music of when she gets really annoyed. I, I feel like whenever I hear that, I kind of feel that ee, 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 ee. Um, but maybe that's just me. But there's some, these challenges of kind of the misperceptions of archivists. I think we also have to uh be clear about the realities where there's an economic impact about what we do both as individuals and the profession we tend to uh work in a very precarious field it tends to be understaffed under resourced we're asked to do many different things um and not really given a lot of resources or labor or time to do it so there is a definitely an economic impact to the work that we do um, and I, I think we add value, um, we add to an organization, but if you look at, you know, the P&L or the budget where we take resources, but I think we're equally giving equal or more uh, value back. And of course, there's just misunderception, uh, misunderstanding and perception differences. Just, you know, we obviously think what we're doing is valuable, um, but I think we we naturally have a bit of uh we get a little bit defensive i think because it is I, I feel like archivists have to kind of justify our existence sometimes um i've certainly felt that way throughout my career um and i'm hoping maybe perceptions are changing or at least let's say through this um, book and through this webinar series um we're at least discussing it and then giving you some tools to uh, counteract some of those misunderstandings um, oops, let me go this way. So branding. So branding is a way to give a consistent, um, consistent way of kind of talking about our purpose and our identity, and it helps communicate organization values. It helps to say that as archivists, we are on board with what the organization is doing. We are consistent. I think because archives are kind of a bit unknown what we do, it's, it, it's even more important that we're being consistent um, with the type of services that we offer and what people should expect. It should be, there shouldn't be any surprises beyond people kind of educating themselves about what we do. So that's the purpose of branding is kind of um, presenting that uniform, um, uh, uniform service and consistency. Branding also helps reshape perceptions. Again, it's going back to the dusty, old, cloistered. We want to kind of get rid of that. We want to show that we're modern, we're contemporary. Um, branding also helps us become strategic partners. It helps us um, project to others that we are helping them. We are here. We are new. We are um, up to the challenge. We are helping them. We're not just this old thing or like, you know, the story room where once something is done it goes to us like we are we are in the mix of what's happening within an organization and it really helps define the services essence so when people are looking to you to help them there should be again that consistent feeling of of, of uh, and no surprises so establishing an uh, archival brand is articulating the core mission so the mission of the organization and the mission of the archives there should be some overlap, you know, we, the archives should be supporting the organization. There should be some of that shared values, that shared mission. There's a lot of expertise that we want to put forward. So yeah. as archivists, we are trained in all aspects of, you know, ethics of digital preservation, of traditional uh, conservation, of organ organizing things, describing things cultural sensitivities, we have so much expertise that we bring to the table. And so 
I always say, you know, we have to, we, sometimes we don't know what we, what we know compared to other people. Like what, what we know, we think everyone knows, but actually we're pretty, really well-trained and we can articulate, uh, articulate that to others. And it's a benefit to your colleagues. So you're adding something, you're helping them do their work faster, easier, um, with less stress, um, better workflows. I mean, that's all about what this kind of archival brand looks like. So part of that is defining the purpose. So thinking about taking a step back and being thoughtful about your department and saying, what does the archives do best? Like, what do you think your strengths are? And it could be what you think is best as an archivist, but it's also what your colleagues perceive as best. And that might be, that might be a Venn diagram that there's some overlap, complete overlap or completely separate. So I think knowing what your strengths are and also perceived strength and, and capitalizing on both. Um, so why does the archives exist? Like what was the original purpose of the archives and how can you tie that to the daily um, operations and projects that your organization does? What I've seen sometimes, depending on the organization, is there's this, an establishment of the archives, and then it's like a waxing and waning, almost like a moon. Like I, I'm, there's some organizations I look at, and I kind of, they're more kind of in the cultural sector, I should say, and I'll watch to see, there's always a role, like I, I see where, okay, there you, I, maybe I used to know an archivist that worked there, for example, like I knew that position, I knew that was like a full-time archivist role, and I'll kind of check in once in a while and see, okay, like how is this, are they call, I'm calling it something different, is it a, is there are no archivists at all, is it full-time again, it's very interesting that some organizations go through that waxing and waning of that archivist role, um, ideally, what we want in every organization is to establish at least one full-time archivist role and to keep it there. You know, once it's established, add to it, but at least keep it there. That, for me, is the goal that I see when I'm working with organizations. So, and I think part of that is, is looking at, okay, why was the archives created in the first place and continu continuing that role? I was talking to a client recently and we're, we're putting together a role that's, um, it has some, some part of it's gonna be archives, some records management. And it was interesting that the perception was like, maybe this would be a term, um, like a term archivist, like, okay, once things are organized, okay, then we're done. Which I thought that was really interesting because I thought, well, once things are organized, there's some you know parts of the office that need to be, organized and offsite storage. And there's kind of some easy projects that need to be taken care of, but that's where I think the fun happens afterwards. Like it's not something that, okay, we've organized everything, we've digitized everything, or, you know, the share file is all organized and then we kind of go home. There's always more that can be done and that rule can always expand. So all that to say is that it's not just, uh, archives to me are kind of a living, it's a living position where it changes all the time. So we do want to make sure that we're defining that purpose and that maintains that purpose is contemporary, that's living and breathing. And, and it expands with the organization and it, it grows with the organization as well. And then thinking about the archives founding history. So obviously, um, archives was if there's an archives department or archives well there's a reason why it happened and so I certainly see that with um it's usually when an organization has reached a level of maturity where they understand that they've been around for a while and they have enough of the past knowledge and materials and um things that they're doing that they really need a role to take care of some of that um, information and so Ideally, you know, an organization would be born and you would have an archivist in that role right away. But I see that as part of like the maturing like that, that um, it's almost like a phase where it goes to kind of a startup type of culture, like a beginning, let's say of a nonprofit, and then it gets to a more mature nonprofit. And that's where I think the founding that, of that position happens. That's what I've seen. So I think it's important to really talk about why the archives exist 
and the founding history and always bring it back to that and make it relevant to everything that's happening currently in your position. So we want to understand stakeholders. And I think this is, you know, I always say this is sometimes the most difficult part. Um, I'm working with someone that we're, we procured software and now we're implementing it, which I always say like software is the easy part. Like there's been so much um, meetings and procurement and IT is involved and everything to get the software. And I'm like, the software is the easy part. It's the stakeholders, it's getting buy-in. It's the people and the processes that are the most difficult part. Software is very logical, people are not. Um, so we want to think about who are the stakeholders within your organization that you can do some of this branding for and think about who does the archive serve? Who are the obvious people that um, benefit, benefit from the archives and the work that you do? And then how do they view your strengths? And again, kind of going back to a previous slide, your idea of what the archive strengths are and their perception of what the strengths are might be completely different. Um, but what their their perception is definitely valid, and we want to make sure we understand. Um, and I would also think about, you know, who who do you serve? And that might be obvious, but there might also be other people that you haven't really thought about, um, you know, other departments or other people that would be, um, you know, just maybe it's a matter of reaching out to, of doing some branding towards that they can be an ally as well. So we want to explore opportunities. So thinking about what are opportunities that the archives can use to its advantage. So I always see, for example, if there is any type of big milestone or anniversary, that's when people are suddenly, the decision makers are suddenly really interested in the archives because they're looking at photographs, they're looking at um, past publications, they're looking at how can we um, how can we use some of these resources, let's say for fundraising? And there might be a variety of reasons uh, that people would, that might, might be good opportunities, let's say a, um, turning over of staff. So if you have um, significant staff members that are retiring, or if there's change in leadership where you're looking at someone who's very new to a role, wants to get up to date about kind of the history of the organization, that could be an opportunity. Anytime there is, again, an anniversary or um, let's say a capital campaign related to, you know, we want to have a new building or we want to renovate a building. Sometimes people want to look at, um, you know, past uh, images of a building, for example, if you have board members where there's a changing of board members, um, if there's a new program that's being developed or a new um, project, that might be a good opportunity, like a digitization project or a website project. Those are opportunities that come up that um, there are ways that you can kind of uh, help brand uh, the archives. And I think there's ways to think about kind of operations. So there's two ways to think about it. One is obviously the projects. So projects are one-time endeavors. Um, and so that that's a, a good opportunity to grab onto. There's also kind of the operational parts of an organization that goes through a year. Um, so maybe if you know during the holidays, people might need the archives or at the end of the fiscal year, for example, they might need something from the archives. So there's a way to think about what are these opportunities that you can reach out to people and let them know that you can help them or that you have resources that would be helpful to them. So how do the archive strengths play into current opportunities. So again, thinking about what you have, what are some, um, let's say you, you've got a new collection or you di just digitize a collection or process a collection, what are ways that you can um, really take advantage of those opportunities to again, use it as, as like a PR opportunity um, to talk to people about what you do within your organization. Um, additionally, we want to think about identifying improvements. So we can always improve as, as um, professionals, as departments. So what are areas of, for improvement that both you see and perhaps you've gotten feedback from other members of staff about what can be improved? So what should the archives do to add value that's not doing now? And what should the archives yeah. not try to do? And I think that's equally valuable. So what I found is that especially if 
um, archives have been established for a period of time. Sometimes you come into a role and you really inherit a whole bunch of old stuff. Stuff that maybe made sense, let's say five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe when there was another president that valued something more or we something else. There's stuff like there's roles and um, tasks that you've done that aren't, that are pretty low value. Um, and if you got rid of them you or you stopped doing them, no one would really care. And so sometimes it's kind of, I mean, I found this in, in my past, sometimes it's really hard to give up those things that you think like that I really should be doing it. You feel almost guilty. But I say there's there's always things that we can look at that we no longer need or um, need to do that we can, there's other stuff we can do instead. Our our time, our you know limited resources, limited brain capacity, limited energy could be better used elsewhere. Um, I always find it, um, but personally in, in my consulting business, I look at kind of the end of the year. So kind of December, uh, mid-December to January, where I really do a review of everything, like all the projects I've done, all the, the kind of admin tasks that I do, everything um, that I do. And then I decide, do I want to continue and move forward? In the past, I used to have, um, I was promoting a book on Facebook that was about kind of creating family archives. I was doing a lot of promotion about it. I was doing webinars. I was doing all this stuff. And then, you know, I finally got to a point where I was like, I like doing this. I like educating people about using archives in their, you know, for their personal and family history, but it's not really, it's a lot of energy that's being expended and I'm not really getting much out of it. So I was able to, um, you know, to tell myself I don't need to do that anymore. Um, now that's easy for me to say because I'm a one person organization. I mean, obviously if you're working in a, a bigger organization where there might be stakeholders that disagree, but I imagine there's certain things that you're doing um, right now that you can just give up and move forward to the things that you really should be doing that maybe you just haven't had the time or um, the energy to, to tackle. And now is the time to do it, to really think about that and use that as kind of a way to um, bring the archives and also to advocate for your position and your department. So resource management, this is always a sticking point. So what resources do the archives have? What resources do the archives need? And sometimes there's a big gap between having a meeting. Um, but this is an opportunity to think about maybe there's grants that you could reach out to. Again, maybe this is the way, I, and I found this I found this um, particularly valuable is that, uh, especially if you work, let's say in a nonprofit where they're always trying to fundraise, there's great fundraising opportunities for archives, but it's just a matter of the archivist taking control of it and kind of wrangling it um, from the development office and using them as definitely a partner. Um, but that's a great opportunity to think about how can you bridge that gap through some grant money, for example. And that's another way to showcase your expertise. Um, I remember a couple of years, I mean, this is a past position I had where they were writing, the, the development department was writing this fantastic grant um, for the archives, but they never, um, they wrote, and they promised the world to this, uh, this, uh, this organization that they wanted the grant money from, but they never consulted me as the archivist. And so I could, looking at this grant, I was like, okay, obviously you didn't get it because there's so many there's so many holes in it that only I as an archivist would see and be able to help. And then the organization that gave that grant money was obviously understood archives. And so they could see that there was a disconnect. So that was an opportunity where it was kind of awkward, but I was able to go back and work with them to create a better grant. You know, next, let's talk to some other grant organization. Let's actually, you know, create a grant proposal or submit, you know, submit something to a grant that actually like is based in reality and has, and it had a much better chance of getting funded. Um, so again, that's an opportunity if you, especially if you work in a nonprofit, to work with fundraising and to show your value because the archives can bring in money. A lot of organizations, a lot of 
um, foundations and uh, specific organizations love to fund archives. They they find it valuable and it it's something that is very appealing to a certain subset of people that want to give grant money and let's take advantage of that. And that's a definitely a way to um, brand your archives and to advocate for yourself because you're the expert and you can definitely help the grant writers and the fundraisers within your organization if 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 only they ask for your help you're willing to give it um so assessing threats so i think this is interesting kind of looking at it from archives from a risk management perspective so what are potential threats that undermine the archives and how are weaknesses exposed so this is kind of particularly i think a little defensive um and a little <laughs> negative i guess but i think it is helpful to look at you know I think this goes to perception and thinking about how are you perceived and are there potential threats? And I think this goes back to stakeholders and, and branding. And I mean, I remember, again, this is another kind of crazy story from my past where, you know, there was a CFO that for whatever reason got in his head that the archives were terrible and spending money and why do we need it? Why can't we just throw it away? And it was kind of a crazy uh, interaction, some crazy interactions, some pretty hostile interactions. Um, but I was able to strategize and frankly manipulate um, perceptions where he started to come around where we got some grant money. I helped digitize 990s that he had. I helped digitize past audits that he had. I was able to do a little bit of work an afternoon's worth of work to really make his life easier. And he kind of came around eventually, but it was something that I could see a threat. I could see someone saying like, why is this guy who has no understanding of what I do, like really attacking my position? And and I wasn't in those, you know, C-suite meetings. So I couldn't defend myself. I could only hear it through the grapevine and see how I was kind of treated. And so I was able to finagle my way into at least having him understand that yeah maybe I'm you know maybe archives aren't a money pit like maybe they add value maybe they can get you know some big tech companies to give some big uh, money to the organization through my labor uh, so that was a, a just an example of how I was really thinking about threats and weaknesses in my department and how I try to the best I could to kind of defend myself and uh, mitigate some of those threats and risks. So benchmarking, I think is interesting from adv uh, an advocating point of view and a branding point of view is kind of what peer institutions inspire the archives and what who's doing what archives better and why. So I find that um, when I've been a Lone Ranger myself or as a consultant or when I work with clients that have archivists or people in kind of archival roles within their organization, we can all say the archives are valuable. We should be doing this, that, and the other. We should be hiring more people. We should be doing this, that. And obviously we're biased. So sometimes people, um, sometimes people are more likely to listen to me because I'm a external consultant coming in and telling them basically what the staff is telling them. Sometimes that helps, but obviously I'm biased. Like my, I've dedicated my career to archives. Um, I think they're valuable, obviously. I wanna be paid for this opportunity. So yeah, I, I have a particular perspective. I do think they're valuable. Um, but what I have found is that if I point to if I get a sense of what kind of peer institutions, let's say decision makers look to, and I can say, well, they're doing this, we should do this because they're doing this. That's a way to make that argument. So it's not just me saying it or their staff members saying it, it's actually the peer institutions. I would also say, if you think about aspirational institutions to say, these people are doing it this way. And sometimes they, they look to it. Um, sometimes decision makers will see that as a, uh, aspirational will make sense. So I'll, I'll give an example. So I was working with an institution that was, um, a, I'll just say a particular type of library that had, um, or a particular type of academic institution with an incredible library and special collections. And their special collections blew my mind. Like what they had 
as far as rarity and books was, I, I could not believe it when I saw it, but they used to have a full time position and then it went away. And then they have these amazing, this amazing stuff that's like in, you know, a climate controlled area and it's secure, but they're not really using it. And it's extremely historically value and extremely fiscally valuable as well. So, um, and I was doing a needs assessment. So part of my, what I was trying to do was saying like, yeah, I think we need to hire a full-time person. Um, and I needed to back up that claim, even though it was, I thought it was obvious. So what I did is I looked at all the peer institutions of this particular type of academic institution and this particular type of library, and is able to look at the staffing that they had, the amount of students that they had, the collections that they had, the value of the collections that they had. And I was able to make the argument that, you know, if we benchmark it, we are way below what peers are doing. Um, so that was a way to kind of advocate for that, for that full-time position. I've also been in other organizations where, um, and this is more, let's say a charitable trust or like a very, um, let's say very well-funded foundations, let's say. So uh, I was able to say, yes, we have to do this. You know, I was advocating to do specific roles in this consulting. Um, the organization had to do A, B, and C. And so I was able to look at these aspirational. So I've said, well, I was able to say, well, the Ford Foundation does it this way. The Gates Archives does it this way. Getty does it this way. So they're like top level, you know, the uh, Rockefeller Archive Center does it this way. So I was able to say, you know, here are the like the big players in the field. They're doing it this way. So that may to be aspirational, let's do it that way as well. So I was able to make that argument. In a past position, I think I've said this in past webinars, is that I worked at a cultural, um, like a cultural heritage institution, and I wanted to do specific type of metadata, and everyone was giving me a hard time, and no one was really listening or, or, or interested, but I was able to say, well, the Getty does it this way. Um, the Getty has the art and architecture thesaurus. And because I said it like that, they were like suddenly on board. Well, if the Getty does it, we want to do it too. So it's very interesting psychologically how that happens. But I think as humans, we're kind of peer-based. We look at our um, what other people are doing. We're obviously very comparative. And I think we should use that as archivists to our advantage to get what we want. And to, again, just... Um, strategize to do some branding and do some advocacy advocacy for ourselves. So really looking at what peer institutions are doing and what aspirational institutions are doing and, and doing that benchmarking. Um, so defining identity. So uh, thinking about getting a better sense of kind of, because branding is all about kind of identity and kind of, um, uh, kind of um, getting it to the essence of, of what we do. So think about what are the five words that define the archives? And then what five words do stakeholders use to describe the archives? So again, that might be the Venn diagram that maybe there's some like complete overlap, a little bit of overlap or completely separate. But I think that's important to think about what that identity is and thinking about the words. Um, and really, you know, I think branding exercises or like, I know years ago, there's a whole thing about having personal brands, which is, it kind of sounds kind of yucky, but I think part of it is just kind of condensing, condensing, condensing down what we do into very simplistic terms so we can communicate it. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of kind of five words. What, what is the essence of the identity of the archives? So the four V's, so I, I do wanna give credit to, I got the idea of the four V's from an article by Christy Kaland in the School Library Monthly Journal. And there's a two-part article from, and it was from 2011 and 2012. And so what was kind of interesting in writing um, this book about internal advocacy and doing this webinar series 
is that even though Society of American Archivists, a couple of years ago, they had a great push to kind of to advocate for yourself and, and to do elevator pitches and, and that type of um that type of work. There's not really like practical advice about how to advocate for archives. A lot of archival writing um, comes from the academic world. It's very theoretical and I, I totally get it and I, and, and I totally love it. I'm a big fan of theory, but I love practice too. I'm, I live in practice. So um, what I have found is that libraries and particularly school libraries are really, I found so much um, like the professional literature around libraries and school libraries in particular have been really good about advocating because they have been really under threat. Um, and that school librarianship has been under threat for many, many years, um, just having less roles in the schools and having not even having libraries have calling it resource centers and having it unstaffed. And then now we're in a current climate where libraries are somehow even more um, uh, under threat, which is just mind boggling to me, but that's that's another webinar in itself. All this to say is that I found a lot of um, help and a lot of practical advice from the school library um, professional um, development world about how to advocate. And so uh, Christy Kalin talks about these four V's, vision, voice, visibility, and vigilance. And so I use that idea that she articulated in her articles and I used it to talk about how archivists can um, use the four Bs to to brand themselves and to advocate for themselves. Um, so the first one is vision. So really engaging stakeholders in a collab collaborative process, identifying the archives values, goals, and priorities collectively, fostering mutual understanding, support, and involving stakeholders in decision making. And so that's really as archivists, we're kind of the vision makers. We're we're seeing and we're strategizing. So we're kind of bringing people in. I mean, obviously we have our own point of view. It should definitely be from our perspective, but we do wanna get buy-in from others about what that vision of the archives looks like. And I think that's what's so unique about the positions that we hold. It's not like, again, going back to accounting, it's not like you have a vision for accounting. Um, I mean, you might, and you might wind up like Enron, for example, by doing really creative accounting. Um, but as archivists, we can have uh, invite people to participate in that visioning and how they imagine the archives to be. And I think by getting them to having people be part of that process, you get them more engaged, you get kind of more buy-in to what you're doing and more understanding because they, they understand it more and you're working collectively and collaboratively. Voice is an, another, is like the second V, and it's establishing connections between archives and the organizational mission. It's aligning the messaging with audience interests, the planning the messaging to engage stakeholders, and utilizing spokespersons within and outside of the department. So again, going back to branding and PR, we're kind of, we're giving voice to what we do, and we're really thinking about um, a, uh, connections and uh, messaging um, to get people interested, to get people engaged. I found it very interesting that to have stake, um, stake people within the department and outside. So obviously what I said previously is that staff members that are in archives or libraries or like me as a consultant, we're obviously have a point of view. We think archives are valuable. Um, we have an economic reason why we think it's, you know, ethically we think it's important, but economically we think it's important too. Um, so you can kind of, a really cynical person could say, well, yeah, obviously you're biased. So it's helpful to get people outside of the department to be your allies and your advocates. So I found that really if, and they could be in all um, levels of power and influence. Um, so they could be people that are obviously decision makers like the CEO, if the COO is like aligned with what you're doing or the VP of programs, for example, is aligned, that's great. There's also people that have maybe not so much power but have influence throughout the organization. I had a client, um, it was more of a records management project, but 
it required doing things a lot differently than they had done in the past and getting rid of some records that really um really should have gotten for a from a legal per, not only from a cost perspective from a legal perspective really should have should be destroyed and i remember you know, I was talking about this and you know, making my arguments about records management, which I can do, you know, standing on the top of my head. And I was talking to the COO and what she said is that she really needed to get these two people on board within the organization. And she knew if they got, she got those two people on board, they, other staff members that would look to them and understand. So the, there were two people that were in relatively on the kind of the org chart were on the lower end of maybe power, but they had a lot of influence. They were maybe the first and second people that were hired at the organization. So they were long timers. They had a lot of legacy. They had a lot of institutional um, memory and they were really kind of the guiding light of the organization as it really grew. And this organization is historically really important and did a lot of um, really important advocacy work um, and a really critical, critical historical period. Um, so once we got those people on board, so we had meetings with those two people, we got their thoughts, we listened to their concerns. And once we got those two pe people on board, we could, we could move forward with the project because they got it and they were our spokesperson, uh, spokespeople within the organization. And that was really interesting that, uh, you know, as an outsider, I wouldn't have recognized that, but the COO obviously realized the influence that they had. So think about your organization and do you have people with power and, and or influence that you can get on your side that you naturally already have on your side that can be a little bit more of the branding and, and the advocacy for you? Or um, can you get them on board with what you're doing? So the third V is visibility. So, and this is all about presentation. And I have to say a lot of archives is presentation because it's a black box. People don't really understand what we're doing. They don't really understand metadata or description or arrangement or processing, um, but establishing orderly and attractive spaces. So both online and, and physically, participating in meetings and committees to raise the profile of the archives and the archives department, maintaining a user-friendly website, and optimizing online content. So I have a lot to say about this slide. So um, it's kind of a New York City thing, but sometimes when you're on the subway, we'll, we'll, some dancers will come in and they'll say show time. And then they start dancing around and like flipping around in the subway car. And I think sometimes archives and archivists have to be like that where I know that let, let's say if I'm working with a private client in their home, I know part of that is showtime. Like I have to look very professional. I have to have all my tools. I have to make sure everything is nice and orderly, even though like as I'm working, I tend to make a mess, but I have to like, I'm putting on a show. And as archivists, I think we're putting on a show as well. I remember a role that I had where I, um, I inherited just an office that was just filled with boxes. It was so chaotic. Um, and I'm a very visual person, a very orderly person. And I just, I went into that office and I just felt sick. It looked totally chaotic. Um, no one in the organization wanted to give anything to the archives because it looked like we were already had too much stuff and nothing could be found. So kind of my first order of business was to clean, or, uh, clean and organize what I had, send things to offsite storage, just get a better hold of everything. So like in that first month, I completely re redid that office. Remember there was boxes all underneath my desk. I couldn't even put my legs forward. I got rid of all of that. Like I was able to um, shred the things I needed to shred. I put things in offsite storage. I cleaned things up. I put all the piles of stuff, let's say in a box to deal with later. It was all about presentation. I also remember, you know, I've worked on, um, a lot of needs assessments are helping archives and and um <laughs> I remember this one role like in this library there's this the archives room had doors that had windows that you looked in and if you looked in you would see like a mop bucket and piles of like old boxes and like a broken chair and part of my thing was like people kind of glamorize archives like they're kind of mysterious and a little sexy somehow so let's like 
lean into that perception. So let's have beautiful organized boxes. Let's get rid of all the trash. We don't want this room to look like it's just some storage room. Like let's let's make it look pretty and let's make it look mysterious. And it doesn't require a lot of resources. It does require, I think, labor, like to be able to clean things up. Um, but I think it makes a huge difference. I think another part is the visibility, is the visibility of the archivists in committees and meetings that make sense. So not, um, not the party planning committee, not like the office, like um, housekeeping type of roles, but you know, the committees that matter, the committees that have some oomph that you can interact with people that it's a little bit more high profile. And this is kind of playing politics. And um, I don't know, I'm not a political animal, but I mean, I think maybe a lot of archivists aren't, but I think in, in order to, there's a game that we're playing. So I think it, it's important to be political. So seeing if there's meetings or committees that you can be in that kind of raise that profile. And also not only looking at kind of visually how things are you know, in, in a um, physical space, but also looking at a website. Is the things on your website orderly? Is it easy to find? Is everything consistent? I had a client um, who had a bunch of old, so they kind of came into to the role. There's a lot of new staff into this role and there's a lot of old stuff related to their archives. And it was all different old logos that were used in the past, old fonts. Um, I remember there's this one guy, it was a terrific guide, but it was written with like all different colors. It looked like a ransom letter. I mean, it was just like, was so chaotic looking. And so it, my advice, one of many pieces of advice that I gave them is just to go through all their content online and just make it consistent, make it consistent. Even if that means just cutting and pasting the form into something that had the newest logo, like that type of stuff that you wouldn't think of, but it just gave a sense of everything is up to date. Everything's orderly. It's consistent. You're kind of giving the same visual um, visual sense of, of what you're doing. And vigilance is the fourth V. And so that's kind of working towards success and meaningful value, evaluating, revising, revising processes that you do, maintaining relevance and longevity, monitoring, adapting to needs, technologies, and techniques, and safeguarding enduring significance. So being vigilant. So, you know, do the work that you're doing, but making sure you're on top of things, like making sure that you're always looking at um, processes and what you're doing has relevance and longevity. Um, again, what I said previously is like maybe take perhaps every quarter, maybe every six months, taking a look at what you're doing and seeing is everything up to date? Are there processes that we can make better? Um, are there things that we should be doing or not doing? Again, just being really vigilant about that role and not just sitting on your laurels, but really being you know, a contemporary active um, member of your organization. So I, I've talked about branding, but let's talk about public relations a little bit. So public relations is, it helps influence perception it amplifies impact and it demonstrates value. And so it's always interesting to see, um, like I'm big media. Um, I love to kind of monitor media and see kind of the stories that are being told and why. And so a lot of that is obviously like the celebrity gossip, for example, it is you have <laughs> PR firms, excuse me. PR firms that are putting out these stories. And so I think archivists can do it as well. We can talk about, you know, we just process this collection or we just digitize this thing, or we just acquire this fantastic donation from um, a longtime member of the community, or what are things, what are kind of the tidbits or new information that's happening that we can let people know about. Or, you know, we had this, um, this documentary film crew come in and they used our assets or something like that. There's always stories to be told and to tell people um, about why your archives are important. So engagement campaigns are ways that combine branding and PR strategies and it captures attention, sparks curiosity, and it encourages exploration. So think about, again, what you're doing and how you can 
advocate and tell people um, what you're doing and get them more engaged um, and letting them know about the resources that you have. Uh, PR is also a way to build relationships, so it shows the value of the services and it fosters cross-functional cooperation. So I think a big part of what archives does is be able to support other departments and to um, to make their life easier and to get, let them know about the resources that you have. And so a lot of people aren't necessarily going to seek out the archives, so you need to seek them out and and let them know, you know, we have these great old photographs that you can use or these old annual reports or, you know, we have this historical data or information about past donors or whatever they're looking for, you know, past program metrics, whatever people are looking for. I think it's important to kind of build those relationships and to show that you're, you know, a team player and you have stuff that can really be helpful to them. But they might not know unless you tell them, like most people won't know. Um, so you want to harness development. So any type of positive news, you want to make sure that's like being spread, um, share it broadly. Um, so that could be through email or Slack or whatever you use, word of mouth. Um, and you're also viewing challenges as opportunities for growth. So, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, so thinking about what are opportunities that you can use to your advantage. Again, looking at opportunities and seeing how you can use that to do a little bit of PR and branding for yourself. So advocacy tools are a way to highlight achievements. It gains resources and recognition. It presents challenges as opportunities and it spurs change. So they're thinking about how you can kind of advocate for yourself um, and, and really thinking about kind of the resources and re recognition that you need um, for your organization. And uh, branding and PR is really potent promotion. So I think anytime we can have an opportunity to craft our identity as archivists and as departments, I think that's really important. It helps to amplify our impact. It builds partnerships across the organization. Um, it's a way to reach out to, let's say, the people that you already know are allies, or departments that you know as allies, but also reaching out to maybe other departments that maybe you might not know about how you can help them. And I think part of it is this constant communication. So, um, you know, it's I think it's easy to be in the stacks, to be in the work itself, but a lot of the work that we have to do is to talk about our work. Um, I was, there's someone on Instagram that I really like that talks, she talks about more of like self-promotion and marketing, but she says like, be dramatic, like, like make sure that everyone knows what you're doing. And I think that's slightly exhausting, but I think as archivists, we have to do it. Let's dramatize the work that we do. Let's add a sense of interest and mystery and intrigue to what we do, because we do do really awesome stuff. I find that if I, no one knows what I do when I try to explain it, but or when I say, you know, and I'm an archives and records management consultant, well, let just, like people's eyes just glaze over. But I talk about some of the things that I do and they're suddenly really interested. So I think that's the same thing within your organization. Um, people might not understand the details of it or know exactly what you mean, but if you can give some examples with that constant communication, you can, you can intrigue people to want to learn more. And they, I, I find the um, the feedback is amazing. Once they get kind of, an, they can get their mind around kind of the specifics of what we do. Um, so branding and PR is all about empowering archivists. I mean, I think this is my, my life's mission is to do this, to empower archivists. So we're really strategic partners. Um, as archivists within institutions, we um, contribute to the preserving of institutional knowledge we foster curiosity. And again, going back to talking about what you're doing, the resources that you have, it, people get curious. An intellectual person will get curious and want to ask questions and want to know what you have. And it, I, I think anytime um, we can talk about what we're doing to advocate for ourselves, to do a little bit of branding, a little bit being PR, it influences more enriched organizational future. So people know all the interesting stuff that's happening presently. And in the past, and I think that really influences what the future of an organization looks like as well. 
Um, and, and people are obviously like really intrigued, but they, they have to know about it. And as archivists, we have to do the work of letting people know about it. Awesome, Margo. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And we are also excited to announce that Margo's newest book with Lucidia Press, Preserve, Promote, and Persevere, The Archivist's Guide to Internal Advocacy, is now available on our website. So if you'd like a digital version of that, please feel free to visit our website and get your own copy. And if you'd like to learn more about our archival collections management system called Archivera, please pill please feel free to visit our website or reach out to us at sales at lucidia.com and we'd be happy to have a conversation with you. If you have any more questions on any of our software or our company, our contact details are listed on the screen and please stay tuned for more webinars and content related to this series. On behalf of the Lucidia team, I thank you all for attending today. Thank you and until next time.